at that. I'm even passing the camera car. There you go. Welcome to the episode of Jay Leno's Garage. Today's featured car is my 1932 12160A Custom Auburn. If you're not familiar with Auburn, they were a pretty big automobile manufacturer out of Indiana. Uh, Indiana at one point rivaled Detroit as being the automotive capital of the world. Duesenberg, Cord, so many great cars are made in Indiana. In fact, there's a couple of books about the cars of Indiana. Uh, and this was one of them. E.L. Cord, he owned Duesenberg, Cord, and of course Auburn. And he bought those three companies hoping to build his own version of General Motors. And the Auburn was sort of at the bottom of the ranks. It was Auburn, then the Cord, then of course the impressive and mighty Duesenberg, which might be considered to be the greatest American classic of all time. Uh, so they got a little bit lost. This one here is uh, the custom model. It is a V12. It is 160 horsepower. It has a two-speed rear end. It's got, all, it's got all kinds of trick stuff on it because this was a fast car. This was the equivalent of a Pontiac GTO back in the day. Uh, although Duesenbergs and Packards and Pierce Arrows had a better build quality than the Auburn, the Auburn was like a factory hot rod. You got a reasonably lightweight car, like 4,200 pounds, considered most cars were way more than that, with a big V12 engine, as I said, a three-speed gearbox with a two-speed rear end, which gave you essentially six speeds, if you want to look at it that way. So it was quick. There weren't many cars quicker than this. Probably just the Duesenberg was the only one that rivaled this. And it was a 12-cylinder car. You know, Henry Ford was the father of the low-cost V8, while Auburn was the father of the low-cost V12. And when they built this, it was 1932. And uh, Pierce Arrow, Marmon, Cadillac were all coming out with V16s and V12 engines. And Auburn thought they would uh, kind of join that prestige uh, number of cylinders with this car. The trouble was, I think, they probably priced it too low, and people got a little suspicious. This was $1,400 when the equivalent uh, Cadillac was $3,300 or $3,400, and the others were even more than that. In fact, at one point, these went down to $945 in the height of the Depression. I don't know how they made money. I don't think they did. That's probably why Auburn eventually went out of business. But, you know, again, it was 12 cylinders. It was the Depression, and it doesn't take a genius to know 12 cylinders use a lot more than eight cylinders and way more than a four cylinder. So consequently, they were not really successful. I believe only, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure how many, I think it was under 2,000 were actually sold. But that being said, this car is, was restored by my good friend uh, Randy Ema. Randy is the premier Auburn Cord Duesenberg expert in the country. This is, this is the only make of car we don't do here at the shop because Randy does them not better than new, exactly as new. This is exactly as this car would have left the factory. In fact, he wanted me to point out that he made these mirrors so I could actually drive it on the street. They didn't come with these mirrors here, so he wanted me to point that out. But everything else, uh, six volt system, the whole deal, everything else is exactly as it left, uh, as it left the factory. Even these color combinations. You know, 1932 is my favorite automotive year because by 1932, the American automobile was here to stay. The Model T had sort of come and gone by 32. We proved the cars could be practical. They proved that they could be sensible. And by 1932, in the height of the Depression, automakers were building dream cars, you know, swoopy looking cars with 16 cylinders, 12 cylinders, superchargers, all these kind of high performance options. It was kind of like my second favorite period, the mid 60s, with the GTOs and the 442s and all that kind of stuff. People might not have had any money, but they could dream. And so the big manufacturers were building dream cars, and this was one of them. You know, this is a 133-inch wheelbase. Uh, this model came standard with something called a Start X. I'll explain what that is in a minute. We put the key in, you just turn the key, and the car would start instantly. Uh, the idea being if the car ever stalled, the Start X would automatically start it again so you wouldn't get stuck on the railroad tracks or something of that nature. It came standard with ride control. It came standard with two-speed rear end. It came standard with something called freewheeling. We don't have that anymore. I think freewheeling free -wheeling was invented uh, or innovated, certainly for us, by Studebaker. The way freewheeling worked was you take your foot off the gas and 
the car would disengage from the power plant, so you would just roll. So you couldn't stop on compression braking. It was done to save fuel. You, so you go along at 60 miles an hour, you take your foot off the gas, and you kind of slow down, but not slow down as much as if it was in gear. You know, the engine was slowing you down. Freewheeling fell out of favor because brakes were not as good as they are now, and consequently brakes would wear out much quicker because it wasn't getting any engine braking or going down a hill. People would forget to take it out of freewheeling, and then they'd keep their foot on the brake, and the brakes would burn up, and I don't know, they'd go off a cliff, whatever it is. Well, anyway, freewheeling was popular for about 10 or 15 years, and then it sort of fell out of favor. Uh, this model is a convertible. Um, being a cheaper car than a Duesenberg, this top <laughs> is not easy to put down. You need tools and you gotta get the wrench out and unscrew things and take them off. And it's, it's a whole big deal. And when you put this top down, it rests right on the paint, which scratches the paint. So the idea is to just disconnect the top and take the whole thing off. It's got a rumble seat. It's got wire wheels. I think it's a pretty cool looking car and fast. I mean, you can hit, you know, second gear, hit 60 miles an hour, which doesn't sound like anything now. But again, in 1932, that was a huge deal. This was a hot car and a fast car. Four-wheel brakes, uh, hydraulic brakes, of course. Henry Ford was still using mechanical brakes, which meant instead of having a liquid in a tube like you would with hydraulic, he just had metal rods, you know. Uh, what was Henry Ford's thing? Uh, steel from pedal to wheel, something like that. He actually thought that was better. Uh, and some people agreed with him, but you got a lot more braking force with uh, hydraulic brakes. Auburn was starting to get a little desperate by the time this car came out. I think it was designed by a guy named Al Leamy. I think that's how you say his name. Just one of these whiz kids designers, you know. I mean, look at the design of this car. This is exactly as it was painted back in the day. You know, most cars up until the late 20s were just painted an olive green. Like you see a lot of Harley Davidsons and people think it's a military bike because it's this weird kind of army green. But they were painted those colors because A, shiny colors really hadn't come in for vehicles. And most people didn't have garages. Most vehicles just sat outside. And most vehicles were painted with a brush in the teens and the 20s. So consequently, paint work was not, unless you're getting a high-end car, a big priority. Suddenly DuPont came out with all kinds of these new kinds of really bright, popping colors. And that's something E.L. Cord believed, too. E.L. Cord uh, took over uh, Auburn, and I think Moon was the first company he took over. And his first thing was he had all these kind of boring-looking cars that they couldn't sell. And he pulled them all in and painted them these wild colors, two tones. all, And, and people just went crazy, and he, they sold like hotcakes. In fact, they made him president of the company. He, he did so well. Um, well, let's... Uh, take you to the most impressive part of this vehicle, and that would be uh, the engine. Let me open this up for you. As you can see, there it is, 391 cubic inches, 160 horsepower, dual carburetors. Um, very unusual engine. Um, the valves come in sideways. In fact, I want to show you a picture. Here's a picture of the engine. Look at it closely. Can you see the valves up near the top? They come in from the side. There's a, there's a little pocket, which is the combustion chamber, and the piston comes up, and this was designed so the car could run on the terrible gas of the day. You didn't need to put premium in the car. And they did not detonate the way most cars did uh, because of this engine design. Fred Duesenberg designed this engine. You won't find that in any book. But Randy, being the expert, said they brought Fred in and he kind of went through it and told them what they should do. It's a great book that has a whole chapter on this engine by one of the great uh, automotive authors. Authors, There he is, Carl Ludwigen, I think his name is. I, 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 I always screw up his name. But there it is right there. And it's got every kind of impressive V12. And this is considered one of the most impressive. Uh, you know, there's a racer named Abe, Ab Jenkins, and he set all kinds of records uh, with these. Okay, here's the picture here, and let's go to that close-up. See right at the top of there, see how the valves come in from the side, right here? Kind of a sideways combustion chamber. It's unorthodox and it's different, but it works. Uh, it was quite effective. The engine is smooth and extremely powerful. Here are a couple of cutaways of the engine. Look at it for a minute and see if you can figure out what I'm talking about. As you can see, these engines are really 
I think, works of art. You know, the thing that makes Cars from the Spirit interesting to me is the engine. Uh, you know, I've got a lot of cars that just have, the Packard Flathead is a real dependable, strong engine, but it's not an exciting motor. It was just meant to be uh, dependable and reasonably quick. Not like these. These were genuinely fast. These were, these are fast cars. This is exactly as it looked. That was the engine block color. See, two carburetors here. Here's your manifold. Beautiful manifold. Look at that. Oil filter right there. Fuel pump right there. It puts this back down. Yeah. In all these cars, I don't run water in the cooling systems. I run something called Evans Cool. It's not an ad for them. I just like the product and I use it. And uh, it's a waterless coolant and it's life of the car coolant. You never, ever have to change it. You flush your block. Uh, if you can stick an air gun down there and blow it out for a half hour or so, get every drop of water out, then you put this waterless coolant in it. And since there's no oxygen in the coolant as there is in water, H2O, there's no rust. You know, my Packard had a, uh, the water pump was leaking, so I, had, I pulled the water pump. And, you know, there's a screw that goes into the impeller that holds it on the shaft. And I thought, ugh, I'm going to have to drill this out. I'm sure it's frozen in there from rust. I just put a screwdriver in it gave it half a turn, and it came right out. That's because there's no oxygen in the water. There's no chance for it to rust. It just stays essentially lubricated. Um, this car also has a, uh, a rumble seat, which is kind of cool. Oh, and the windshield folds down. That's pretty cool, too. Um, here, let me, let me open the, uh, let me see if it pops up here. And then you got your rumble seat. And then there's a step plate on this fender. You step on the running board, you step on here, and then you step into the rumble seat here. Uh, not the safest place to be in a crash. Hey, it's 1932. You're lucky you're getting a ride at all, okay, pal? So. But that's basically how it works. So that's pretty cool. Let me just look through the window there. And it just shuts. There we go. There we go. You say, if a Packard or a Duesenberg, you wouldn't have that problem. But hey, it's $2,000 cheaper, so what do you want from me? And he got twin tail lights, of course, which most people didn't have at the time. This is probably what the English would call a CADS car, you know. It looks like something a single guy would have to impress the ladies. And impress them it did, I'm sure. Come on, I'll show you the, uh, the other side of the engine. Okay. And he got the other side here. The cool thing about this engine is it's somewhat symmetrical in that uh, carburetor and everything on both sides. There's your Start X, as I mentioned before. Uh, your Bajor oiling system, that just lubricates. Um, this is an on-off switch. That is not factory. That's just something we put on there. Every car you have, you want to put a battery disconnect switch in it. I'll tell you a story. A friend of mine had a cord, and he took it to a restoration shop. He left the door open like this. And there was a light bulb in, the, you know, in the, you know, in the overhead uh, uh, light, and the cover was plastic, and it stayed on all night. And the plastic got hot, melted, caught fire, and the car burned to the ground. So that's why you always want to put one of those on there. Oh, as you can see, you got uh, dual coils. Uh, they didn't scrimp on this motor. It's a brilliant, brilliant engine. That's your. Uh, Breather tube there, overflow. Wing gets in, comes in here. Well, that's about it, three-speed transmission. Come on, let me show you some of the stuff inside the car. I'll show you the uh, freewheeling device, and I'll show you some of the other things. I'll go over these when we go on a ride. We'll put our cameraman in the car, and we'll show you how they actually work. But You know, one thing I always carry in old cars like this, a copy, or at least in this case, a reprint of the original owner's manual, because owner's manuals in old cars are invaluable. They actually tell you stuff, how to adjust valves, spark plug gap, what tire pressure to use. You ever check the manual on a modern car? Do not drink contents of battery. Do not hit pedestrians when crossing the road. Stop when you see a stop sign. Just stupid stuff. This gives you actual information that you can use. So it's, uh, it's, it's pretty good. Now, I'm going to show you all these gauges and stuff a little bit later when we're on the road, but two of them you wouldn't be able to see when we're driving. This is the freewheeling. What this does is this disengages 
basically the powertrain from the car. So you just roll, you know, with no resistance at all. The advantage of that is you get to save gas. The disadvantage is, as I said before, um, it's a lot of wear and tear on your brakes. And this one down here, this is the exhaust cutout. It says for high speed use, you pull this up and allegedly frees up a couple of horsepower, reduces back pressure and makes the car a little throatier and a little noisier. That's basically what that does. So that's two of the options that were kind of unique to Auburn. Uh, certainly the freewheeling. Uh, as I said before, the windshield folds down, which is really kind of cool. But as I also said before, the top is a pain in the neck to try and get off. It's, so I just leave it up and then I take it off again in the summer. Horn. I think it's time we went for a ride. As I said before, this uh, was a real hot rod of the period, you know. Uh, V12 engine, two-speed rear axle, three-speed manual transmission. Uh, this car was really fast. Don't forget in the 30s, anything zero to 60 under 15 seconds was considered pretty quick. Especially a car that weighed as much as cars did back in the period. These weighs, this probably came in at about 4,300 pounds. The engine alone weighs, I think, 1,161 pounds, something like that. So it's, it's no lightweight, but, uh, but it's strong and it's torquey and very powerful. This is my favorite kind of weather to drive an old car in California when it's just kind of cold out, not freezing, but just kind of chilly. The engine seems to run better, and you get a little bit of that engine heat to keep you warm. Uh, you know, sometimes in California it gets so hot that uh, the cast iron on these old motors, it just throws so much heat, you kind of wonder if you're doing damage. It's probably more psychological than anything else, but on a nice cool day, water temperature stays low. What am I now? 145, 150, so that's not bad at all. Good heavens, actually it should be around 180. A little warm up nicely, the whole engine will sort of, it, it won't get that excessive amount of heat. It's not going to be at 200 or 212, you know. A lot of times the old cars, you always run the risk of boiling the thing over when you're sitting in traffic, especially LA traffic. So today is just a nice day. You get a little bit of engine heat coming through the firewall. Keeps your feet warm with the window open. Ah, the man. Although this is a, a convertible, I like driving it as a closed car. It seems a little cozier. I love these wireless taillights. Take a look. Get a shot of the taillight. I recommend these for all antique cars or old cars that don't have turn signals on them. You don't have to run wires. They're all just uh, radio waves. You know, they're battery operated. You put a battery in the taillight, put a battery in the control, and you can switch them from car to car. They're really terrific. I'll reach down and open the exhaust and see if it makes any difference. Doesn't sound a whole lot different to me. I gotta check that. Maybe a little bit. As I said before, this car doesn't have nearly the build quality of the Packard or the Duesenberg, but then again, it's a third of the price. And I'll take horsepower over any of those other things any day of the week. Ford might have been the first with a low price V8, but Auburn was the first with a low price V12. You know, everybody goes crazy for the speedsters, but there's been so many bad replicas of those and they tend to look cartoonish. I like this, it's a bit more of a sleeper, you know, it just looks like a 32 Ford or any kind of car in that period, but it's got the big V12 and the two-speed rear end, pretty cool. I mean, it rides really nice, I mean, it's 60 miles an hour. I mean, what was the speed limit when this car came out, 45? So cruising at 60, that's a mile a minute, as my dad would say. You see how Auburn was able to set so many speed records with this car. 
Ab Jenkins uh, was the big racing driver of the day. He did the Auburns and the Cords and set all kinds of world records with these things. They were fast. It really is a lot of fun to drive. Let's put the cameraman in the car with me here and we'll show you the, uh, the dashboard and the layout and how all this stuff works. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. Hop in. Let me show you the layout of the dashboard and everything. Okay, first let's go to, this is your key, and this has a thing called a Stardex, which means you don't have to press any buttons, you just turn the key and the car will start automatically. Watch. Okay. Now the advantage to that is if the car stalls, the Stardex will automatically start it again. The reason they put that in was back in the day, a lot of people get stuck on a railroad track and the car would stall and then they get all panicky. Whereas this will keep cranking the motor and, until it starts again. Okay, uh, obviously this is your horn button right here. There you go right there. Now these are those wireless turn signals I was talking about before, right there. Uh, this is your ride control for your shocks, gives you kind of a ride control. This is your heat, not engine heat, this is manifold heat to warm up the engine. Your choke. Uh, this is your, your high speed and low speed rear end. Uh, this is a hand throttle. These are your lights. And this is your advance and retard on your spark. This is your ammeter here. Oil pressure. Speedometer goes to 120, not many did. Temperature. And of course, oil and fuel right there. Uh, and your clips, of course, here to put your top down. Here's your cigarette lighter right next to the GoPro camera. Uh, and uh, let's take her a spin. Let's see what she does. I know 160 horsepower doesn't sound like much nowadays. But back in the day, that was quite a bit, especially in a lightweight or reasonably lightweight car like this. With torque. Torque is what these cars had in abundance. You could climb any hill in second or third gear, no problem. We'll take her up the highway and we'll show you how she cruises. Actually, very nicely. I mean, this is a real, for the time, high-speed automobile. Look at that. I'm even passing the camera car. There you go. You can do 60 in second gear, no problem. Another feature you have in this car is freewheeling. You've got a second knob, looks like a shift knob on the floor. You pull that back and that disengages the uh, drivetrain when you take your foot off the gas so you can freewheel. The disadvantage is it makes you eat up your brakes because you're not getting any compression braking or engine braking. Freewheeling was a big fad beginning in, to about the middle of the 30s and then they realized and too many people losing brakes going downhill and stuff because they weren't uh, weren't getting any compression braking from the engine. Well, there you have it. As you probably guessed by now, and many of you said in the comments section, I really enjoy most doing videos about the cars that I own, like this one here. Uh, as I said, this was restored by my good friend Randy Ema. He is the premier Auburn Cord Duesenberg expert in the country. And he did it exactly as it left the factory. Not better than new, just as good as new. And that's what a, a, a real historian does. Uh, that's why I let him handle these, because he knows every aspect of these cars. And uh, this really was an exciting period in automotive history. 1932, as I said before, was my all-time favorite year. This was as exciting as a GTO or a 350R Mustang back in the day because, once again, it was the big engine with the high-performance options like the two-speed axle and all that kind of stuff in the medium-priced or low-priced car, you know. Uh, 
that was what made it. This this put high performance into the uh, the reach of maybe not the average guy, but the little above average guy. Uh, the fact that it ultimately wasn't success, success was probably, of course, due to the Great Depression. But that being said, it's a fun car to drive now. I really enjoy it. I'm going to hit my start X now, watch it start up automatically, and pull it back in the garage. We'll see you guys next week. See you later. Mm-hmm. <laughs>